Hi, I'm Greg Lefebvre, and this is The Compulsive Storyteller, a series of short personal stories where we explore the idea that truth can be stranger than fiction. This week's episode is entitled Menage à Toi. Menage à Toi. We met at the opening of a Klaus Oldenburg sculpture exhibition. He was the artist who made his reputation turning common household objects into simple monumental sculptures. We are both peering from opposite sides through the hole in his vertical eight foot tall clothespin at the same moment. The hole is at the top, the clamping part of the clothespin. She smiles, I smile, and then I come around to introduce myself. She's a beauty, long auburn hair, blue green eyes, and a great smile. Also, she's my height, which I prefer in a woman. She has a lovely figure, just the right amount of curves. We click immediately, so much so that after a few wines at the opening, she invites me back to her place in Brooklyn Heights. That was a week ago, and I'm still here. Lucky me. Her name is Lindsay. The apartment is a large three-bedroom. One bedroom she sleeps in, one is her stained glass studio, and the third is her office. I can't even imagine how much rent she must pay. Plus, the place is beautifully and expensively furnished. I figure she must come from money, or does very well selling her stained glass works. After our idyllic honeymoon week, when I get back to my art studio, some online research reveals no trace of her stained glass studio or exhibitions. I have to admit, I'm completely smitten. She has an easy, chill way about her with a ready smile and a very dry sense of humor. It's been a long time since I felt about anyone the way I feel about her. Our two lives slip into a nice rhythm, sleeping over at each other's places three or four nights a week. As the months pass, I fall more and more deeply in love with her. When I'm not with her, I'm thinking about her constantly. The mystery of how she supports her lavish lifestyle is a nagging puzzle, though particularly after she shares with me that her parents, who live in the Hamptons, have cut her off completely from any financial support. One night at her place, she asked me to help her unroll and arrange furniture around a new Persian carpet she just purchased. It's the real thing for sure. So I ask, wow, what a beautiful carpet. How much did that set you back? She hesitates a bit, then responds, a little over 10,000. Wow. Now my curiosity about her lack of any visible means to support is overwhelming, but she cooks a great dinner and then walks me into the bedroom and we undress and climb into bed. I think we're both more than satisfied with our sex life. Afterwards, as we lay side by side, my niggling suspicion gets the best of me and I ask, I'm curious, Lindsay, if your parents cut you off and you don't seem to be doing any stained glass project, where did the 10K come from? She doesn't answer right away, then responds, Are you sure you want to know? Yes, I do. After a long pause, she exhales deeply, possibly because she's concerned about my response, and begins, I have 10 different men who each pay me $2,000 a month. I placed an ad in the Village Voice Personals, which read something like, European beauty, well-bred, well-traveled, and well-educated, seeks a rewarding relationship with a successful businessman. She explained she received over 300 responses and only chose the 10 men she liked after interviewing each in a phone conversation with her line blocked. She continues that the relationships all started as sexual but evolved over time from physical intimacy more toward psychotherapy and marriage counseling. My body goes cold as she talks. I get the chills, jump out of bed, and run to the bathroom, where for the first time in my life, my emotions make me throw up. I hurriedly dress, and when I flee from her apartment, she doesn't try to stop me. Getting back to my studio, I'm completely crestfallen. I guess what I'm suffering from, most simply put, is a broken heart. Over the next week, she repeatedly calls me and leaves messages on my machine. I try to make her dead to me, steeling myself against any thoughts about her, just icy, numb, forced indifference. 
When I finally weaken and play one of her messages, I hear, Greg, I have to go into the hospital to have a cervical cyst removed, and that will be a perfect time to quit this whole business and just be with you. Please think about it. I really love you, and know we can have a great relationship. Please, please, please call me back. After I agree to see her, we have a tearful rendezvous in a coffee shop where she reiterates her offer to call it quits with the other guys. The next time we meet up is in her hospital room, after her surgery. I bring along a bunch of flowers from the hospital gift shop. When I enter the room, there's a bank of huge, beautifully arranged bouquets, each of which puts my tiny offering to shame. Lindsay says apologetically, I told all of them not to visit to avoid any discomfort for you, but I didn't tell them not to send flowers. And believe me, your flowers mean more to me than all of theirs put together. They're rich guys, and that's what rich guys do. They send ostentatious gifts. She then pauses and smiles. Don't forget, Greg, in the end, you got the girl. And even though times will be tough for a while, we're going to have a great life together. There's a certain perverse pleasure in thinking to myself that she's giving up on a quarter of a million dollar a year job just to be with me. She then beckons me over to her bedside, kisses my forehead, both my cheeks, and plants a big wet kiss on my mouth. I'm completely on board. It's now been two years since her operation, and true to her word, she's a wonderful partner. Plus, our financial situation has taken a big turn for the better. I receive a large $200,000 sculpture commission for Highland Park, a suburb north of Chicago. Lindsay takes on two roommates, a Russian woman named Katiana and a French woman named Francoise, so that she can afford her apartment. I often tell Lindsay stories from my earlier life, and luckily, she's a good listener. One day, I share a very sexy story about a woman named Maria, who I met before I met Lindsay. She's intrigued and asks if I have any photos of her. From a drawer, I dig some out, including one from a pictorial that was in Playboy magazine. When she studies Maria's photo, she finds her to be very attractive. For more on Maria, listen to The Compulsive Storyteller, Episode 67, entitled Free Fall, Part 3, Lover Boy. Then Lindsay asks me, have you ever had a threesome? When I answer no, she continues, would you like to? I think about her and Maria together, and I'm immediately turned on. Sure, why not? After many phone calls and some last-minute cancellations by Maria, Today is the day she is finally coming over for lunch. I've been delirious all week, looking forward to this moment. I think the idea of a threesome with two beautiful women is the dream of almost every man, and for me, that dream is about to come true. I've prepared filet of sole, which I've cooked and then chilled, to be served on a bed of greens. It's a beautiful, sunny, early summer day when Maria rings our buzzer an hour late. We've had to schedule her visit on a day when Katiana and Francoise will not be in the apartment. Maria enters looking spectacular. Her skin has turned dark from summer sunbathing, and her deep, dark eyes make a great contrast with the white, two-layered, see-through lace dress she's worn. Introductions are made, and I pour her and Lindsay a glass of chilled rosé. When I go back into the kitchen to put the final touches on lunch, the fish has disappeared and I discover that the cat has dragged it under the table to the back corner. Damn it, I say. When I stab at the cat with a broom handle, she relinquishes the fish. Lindsay calls out to me, Is everything okay in there? Everything is fine, I respond in a sparkling voice while washing off the fish. When I return to the dining room with my luncheon tray, Lindsay and Maria have been chatting, and Maria announces, I'm feeling a lot of tension in the room. I think we should just be friends. Lindsay heartily agrees, and I want to go into the kitchen and slip my wrists. I can't believe this turn of events. After resisting the urge to kick the wall and smash some dishes, I put on a happy face and return to the dining room, hiding my disappointment. I serve lunch, and then I decide I need to be proactive. How about I roll a joint, and we smoke a little weed? Lindsay and Maria agree, and I continue, Maybe this will lessen the tension in the room that Maria is feeling. The joint is rolled, we pass it around, and each of us takes a deep drag. 
Before you know it, we have a happy little toast and finish our wine. Next, I suggest, maybe a little massage would help with the tension too. After all, you're both excellent masseuses. So we head into Lindsay's bedroom, and Maria has no hesitation in peeling off her layers of lace and laying face down on the bed. At only five feet tall, she has a perfect miniature body. When she posed for the shots in Playboy, because she was so beautifully proportioned, the photo gave no clue that she was so petite. Now she looks spectacular with her string bikini tan line standing out against her perfect brown skin. Lindsay and I stripped on as well, but there's a problem. The afternoon sun is bathing the room with such intense light that even with the curtains drawn, it's still too bright. So we leave our clothes in Lindsay's room and adjourn to Katiana's room, which is on the shady side of the building. Maria resumes lying face down, and while Lindsay straddles her thighs and I kneel beside the bed, we start massaging Maria's beautiful backside. She moans with pleasure. Then I lean forward and gently kiss both her perfect cheeks while I think to myself, thank God, after so much adversity, this is finally going to happen. Suddenly, Lindsay freezes when she hears keys in the front door, and Katiana enters the front foyer. Covering herself with a towel, she runs to head off Katiana, ushering her into the dining room, while Maria and I scamper naked back across the hall into Lindsay's bedroom. Our whole comic farce makes it almost impossible not to roar with laughter. Our first triple date has turned out to be a disaster, although it was not without a few bright spots. Our next triple date is much more successful, and after a couple more, when Maria complains about how difficult it is for her to come into the city to visit, Lindsay and I have a little side conference and decide to invite her to move in with us. She readily accepts. Also, with my art commission money, I now have rented a much larger sculpture studio with a more comfortable living area, so the three of us can live together in privacy without Lindsay's former roommates around. Now we have a true menage a trois. One of the big surprises for me about my new situation is that all mutual decisions seem to be made with Lindsay and Maria teaming up against me. For example, we have great fun cooking together, and when I suggest that we cook in the nude, both women frown. Lindsay says, first of all, it's a dangerous idea, and secondly, it's a dumb idea. We're cooking, not having sex. Maria claps her hands and laughs in agreement. A threesome is different from a twosome in so many unforeseen ways. Who sleeps in the middle? Who shops for groceries? How do we decide what to do socially? And where do we go when we go out at night? In almost all these instances, a united front of Lindsay and Maria call the shots, even though I'm the guy who finances the whole operation. At the outset of our relationship, I make one non-negotiable demand. Ladies, there's one thing I want to insist upon. When I was young and had a new girlfriend, sometimes we'd reach the point where she would sit on the toilet with the door open while talking to me. I thought that this was a good sign in terms of intimacy. I now think quite the opposite. Please let's keep the door closed and keep a little mystery in our relationship. The girls both agree. This all sounds like a big tug of war, but by and large, the three of us have a great time together. You guys are great, I sometimes say to them in bed, and they always respond, you're great too, Greg. Then they each kiss one of my face cheeks while they simultaneously start whacking me with pillows. It's all so much fun. I haven't had a pillow fight since I was a kid. We also have a lot of fun in the bedroom getting into all sorts of positions and arrangements. It's pure heaven. The interesting thing about all sexual relationships, but with the threesome the possibilities increase exponentially, is that if you're curious, free and experimental, there are all kinds of positions. When we try to keep track of all our many firsts, we discover there's no point in trying because they're endless. In the beginning of our relationship, when we go out to bars and restaurants together, we don't hide the fact that we're a threesome, hugging and laughing and kissing together, which makes us the center of attention, particularly for lonely, drunk guys. It's amazing how some guy will just walk up and try to cut in because there's an extra woman present. Sometimes a guy will actually wedge himself in between me and the girls with his back toward me. My response? Sorry, man, we're out celebrating together, and we'd like to be left alone if you don't mind. One time when Maria gently pushes a guy aside with her hand, the guy roughly pushes her back hard, and things take a turn toward the violent. But Lindsay is great at stepping in as the peacemaker. A couple of times with a group of drunk macho men, 
we find ourselves in real physical danger. They can be so primitive. Case in point, one of them yells at me, hey man, why the fuck should you get to have two women? What are you, some rich asshole out with your whores? There's no way to reason with a drunk, so the tactic that works best for us is not to engage at all and to move to another part of the bar or just leave the building altogether. No PDA has become our mantra in all clubs and bars. As the months pass, one dynamic in our triangle begins to change. Because both Lindsay and I are college-educated and Marie is not, in many intellectual conversations she feels left out. At first we try to include her, but it's really impossible to do so without acting like teachers or being condescending. Slowly but surely, being left out causes her to withdraw from our relationship bit by bit. There are times when she passive-aggressively fights back, like the night she brings home a guy she met in a bar and he thinks he's going to take part in an orgy. When Lindsay and I set him straight in no uncertain terms, they both leave together and Maria disappears for a few days. This makes us both realize that we miss her presence very much. We suspect that Maria has started seeing someone. When we organize a big party to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the three of us moving in together, we're both shocked when Maria turns up with a very large, heavy-set, muscular lesbian sporting a flat-top haircut. Her name is Dina. She obviously loathes us. When they slow dance and she enfolds Maria in her brawny arms, Lindsay and I retreat to the kitchen in jealous shock. What a surprise, Lindsay says. She's so unattractive. I respond, yes. I'm very disappointed that our beautiful little Maria would choose her. After our disastrous anniversary party, Dina starts showing up regularly to take Maria out on dates, creating the most awkward situations imaginable. She refuses to come in when invited and won't even speak to us. After a few more awkward dates, Maria comes home one night and announces that she's moving to Miami with Dina. We're both so heartbroken that Lindsay and I start to cry, but Maria is determined and begins to pack right away. We try to reason with her that she should get to know Dina before moving far away with her, but she's not hearing us. The next day, Dina shows up with cardboard boxes and packing tape, and they will not accept our help. So they pack while we sit miserably in the kitchen. Then, just like that, Maria is gone. Lindsay and I feel so lonely after she leaves. It's like one of our limbs has been cut off. After a few days feeling forlorn, we decide to do something positive to cheer each other up, so we build a little altar to our menage a trois. The centerpiece is a white frame photo of Maria in her white lace dress taken the first day we met. There's a pink ribboned lock of Maria's hair that Lindsay saved after she gave her a haircut, a silver rhinestone tiara that I bought Maria on her birthday, and a couple of pieces of jade jewelry that she left behind. We burn some candles, play some of our favorite music, and say goodbye to our lover and our friend. It's well documented in various psychology papers that when a couple's only child dies, there's a high probability that they will separate within a year or two. Sadly, that is what happens to Lindsay and me. We just can't get over the sadness that subsumes us, and finally, we decide to call it quits. Now it's just me. I make a replica of our altar to Maria with the original parts divided evenly so Lindsay and I can each have one. Every year, I light a candle on the anniversary of the beginning of our menage a trois. Are you ready to tell your own story on The Compulsive Storyteller? 
We're launching a new segment of guest storytelling, and we want to hear your stories. Email a voice recording to hello at thecompulsivestoryteller.com. I'll play selected stories on upcoming episodes. Try to be as clear as possible in your recording, and we reserve the right to lightly edit them for length and clarity. Leave your name or contact information in your voicemail or email, and let us know if you'd like the story to be anonymous. I can't wait to hear from you. The Compulsive Storyteller is now co-produced by Greg Lefebvre and Fadia Monserrat, who's also arranged the music and created the special effects. Emily Ramon does design, research, editing, and marketing. Peter Kakoma has made our theme music and for many seasons co-produced the show with me. If you enjoyed this week's episode, let us know. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Compulsive Storyteller, and we'd love to hear from you. This podcast is independently produced, so we really appreciate all your help and support. Share the show with your friends, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. You can also check out our website, thecompulsivestoryteller.com, for more information. Thanks for listening, and if you didn't like this one, the next one will be another story. All characters and events portrayed in this podcast are based on my truth, with some names and facts changed for privacy. The conversations and dialogues are based on my best memory, but are not word-for-word recreations. Mm-hmm.